For the vast majority of people, dying at the age of 45 is tragic. But this cannot be said about Johnny Tapia. On the contrary, it was an amazing feat due to his life circumstances that he made it to that age. From his teenage years to his death, he walked on the razor's edge all his life. Experiencing serious problems with drugs and alcohol, Johnny, who chose the appropriate nickname, Mi Vida Loca, translated my crazy life, more than once found himself on the verge of death. Several times after drug overdoses, Tapia was in critical condition, but each time the doctors managed to bring him back from the edge. Johnny even tried to voluntarily end his life, but again was saved. Critics sarcastically suggested that he should be taught how to end his life correctly. Unfortunately, on May 27, 2012, Johnny was found dead at his home in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with no signs of a violent death. One of his family friends said, he was on the verge of death so often that it is very hard to believe that this finally happened. Do you love box? I love the box. Are you a winner? I'm a winner. Welcome to hell. Johnny Tapia's life began in February 1967 on Friday the 13th in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The lion's share of the population of this large southern city is Hispanic. Crime and violence were commonplace. Little Johnny was early acquainted with death, which walked beside him everywhere. The child never knew his father and grew up believing that he was dead. Once a tour bus in which Tapia was traveling flew off a cliff, rolling down from a height of 25 meters. The seven-year-old Johnny survived, but his pregnant seatmate did not. In May 1975, eight-year-old Tapia woke up to screaming. Parting the curtains, the boy was stunned. His mother, Virginia, was chained to the back of a pickup truck pulling away from the home. The boy ran to his grandparents but they sent him to bed, believing that their grandson was just having a nightmare. This nightmare will sit on the child's shoulders and stay with Johnny Tapia forever. For when the police found his mother, Virginia, she was the victim of a violent crime. She had been brutally attacked. She later died in the hospital and her son was not allowed to say goodbye. The child remained in care of elderly relatives in a large and dysfunctional family with numerous brothers uncles and sisters. They were all huddled in a three-bedroom house. In such conditions, the youngest usually takes the role of the victim. Tapia's grandfather became the amateur boxing world champion and taught his grandson the basics of self-defense. Soon, nine-year-old Johnny began to fight with other children under the supervision of his uncles, who were betting on these fights. If Johnny lost in a bar or in a parking lot, at home, he received an extra dose of punches from his relatives and was deprived of food. But the physical pain paled in comparison to what boiled inside the small, lonely boy. Tabia's steel was tempered with resentment and anger. He felt like a hunted fighting dog, and life threw up new trials. Arrests and street fights were a common occurrence. Boxing seemed like a salvation for the unfortunate teenager, since he had both the physique and the spirit of a boxer. From the age of 11, the boxing gym became his home. The boy grasped information and learned new techniques with ease. Johnny Tapia fought over 100 amateur fights, winning 65 ahead of schedule. In 1983 and 1985, he became the champion of the National Golden Gloves the most prestigious amateur boxing tournament in the United States. The talent from Albuquerque was sponsored by a large local businessman, the owner of the Coors Beer Brewery, Joe Maloof. Tapia decided to turn pro. Between wife and mistress. Johnny's career began in 1988 with a draw. Tapia went on a winning streak and in the 13th fight defeated future champion John Michael Johnson. Soon he was waiting for a contract with top-ranked promotions. Early on, Johnny alternated between bantamweight and junior bantamweight fights and was nicknamed the Babyface Assassin. 
1988, he unfortunately was introduced to cocaine. The first time was a mistake. The second time was a habit. Cocaine became my mistress, Johnny later said. In 1990, the drug was found during a routine doping test, and Tapia received a suspension from boxing for three years, where he sunk into oblivion. He began to wander the streets, fighting for drug money, which would result in periodic arrests. From time to time, his attempts to return to the ring were thwarted by positive drug tests. Once at a party, Johnny met a girl named Teresa. At first, she rebuffed him, but he did not think of giving up. In 1993, they got married. On their wedding night, Tapia disappeared and then was found with an overdose of cocaine. The first year of marriage turned out to be a hurricane. Once Teresa had to lock her addicted husband in a small apartment with bars on the windows, where her mother brought him food, pushing it between the bars. Soon, the boxer's mind cleared up. Teresa became Johnny's manager and helped him with his addiction struggles. After two miscarriages, they decided to adopt children. Tapia was brave enough to openly talk about his shortcomings and strong enough to hold back any blows of fate. But like everyone else, he had a weakness. He could not resist the temptation. Breakdowns were common every three to four months, followed by rehabilitation and countless prescription drugs, which did not give the desired effect. Johnny was controlled by his emotional stress and once said that, depression has plagued me throughout my life. In March 1994, he returned to boxing. The ring was a lifesaver for the Albuquerque native, a legal way to unleash his demons. Johnny Tapia said more than once, he sees every rival as the killer of his mother. The boxer soon realized that he had outgrown his first nickname. He became known as Mi Vida Loca, which means my crazy life. These words were tattooed on the boxer's belly. The nickname Mi Vida Loca came from the lips of Oscar de la Hoya, and his coach, Robert Alcazar. Oscar helped Tapia by placing him in isolation in his camp at Big Bear Lake. Every time the troubled Johnny showed up in the gym, Oscar and his coach would ironically exclaim, Mi Vida Loca. In Albuquerque, Mi Vida Loca often fought on the undercard of Danny Romero, a puncher who quickly became a local star, while Tapia was in trouble outside the ring. In October 94, Johnny was waiting for his first title fight in his career, but it was also held on the undercard of Romero, who did not have a full-fledged title. So Johnny Tapia got the chance to become WBO champion in the second flyweight. Opposite him stood a San Salvador native, Henry Martinez. From the very first seconds, viewers watched a tense and competitive fight. Johnny acted much more accurate, and in the second half of the fight, his true punching power was displayed. After Martinez was knocked down in the 11th round, the referee called a stop, and Albuquerque had its own world champion. Tapia knocked out ex-champion Rolando Bohol and defended the title. There was talk of a fight with Danny Romero, in 1995, 28-year-old Johnny met with 23-year-old Mexican Ricardo Vargas. The fight took place in Las Vegas as part of a big boxing event with Oscar de la Hoya. Vargas moved quickly, performing short punches. The beginning of the fight turned out to be smooth. However, in the sixth round, Tapia put him on the canvas. In the seventh, the fighters butted heads, leaving both with cuts. In the eighth round, the doctor stopped the fight. Two judges gave a draw based on the result of the seven rounds, and one said that Tapia was the winner. A second draw appeared on Mi Vida Loca's record. In 1995 and 96, Johnny performed defense after defense, demonstrating an impressive frequency of performances for this level, six fights a year. A fight with an old rival. Johnny Tapia and Danny Romero started at the same sports club in Albuquerque with the same coach, but were completely different fighters. 
Their rivalry began many years earlier when Romero's father trained both boxers. Tapia's split with the Romero family had not been on good terms. Romero is a restrained guy from a relatively prosperous family, while Tapia is a restless street fighter. Danny's life was discipline, Johnny's life was darkness and chaos. Their lives were on a collision course, and once Tapia and Romero realized that they could not avoid a confrontation, they decided to meet in the ring. The true reason for the animosity was never revealed by either side. The American media portrayed their meeting as a grudge match or showdown to stigmatize the fight and increase publicity. Their rivalry divided Albuquerque, New Mexico into two camps. The fight took place on July 18, 1997. Many people thought that Romero's punching power would be a problem for Tapia. But Tapia answered by saying, every time Romero hits, I'll laugh. Romero responded, then you'll be laughing the whole fight. Knowing about their open hostility, the public expected to see a bloodbath. But what they received was a little different. The dynamics of the bout, the quality of the boxing, and the speed were of the highest level. Tapia behaved as an aggressive improviser. Winning the fight was his end goal, as well as pleasing the audience. Their rivalry was off the charts, and Tapia's answer to this was to be collected, self-confident, and follow a fight plan, keeping his motions under control. Romero played well for the first third of the fight, but it seemed like he was waiting to get in one hard punch, while Tapia came out exclusively to box that evening. As George Foreman noted, Danny Romero was still a very young boxer and did not seem to understand that fights like this cannot be won in the first two rounds, and you must be prepared for anything. Romero realized his mistake after four rounds, and in the fifth, he stopped waiting for one good punch and actually started boxing. The round was the first that Romero won on the cards. The success of his opponent discouraged Tapia a little, causing him to give up the sixth round. Johnny was walking on the edge of a knife at the beginning of the seventh round. He missed a blow and decided to fake a knockdown. Fortunately, the referee realized that Johnny was playing, but he had every right to count it if he wanted to. Still, that was Johnny Tapia. This moment, however, seemed to wake Tapia up, and he gathered his strength. In general, the seventh and eighth rounds were very competitive, and no one would have been able to say who would win. Tapia hit more with higher accuracy. Romero hit less, but his punches were harder. After eight rounds, it seemed like the audience would continue to see this high level of competition in the rest of the fight. 
However, there was a turning point in the ninth round. Johnny Tapia started pressuring Romero, and Danny was having trouble coping with the onslaught. The speed of the fight increased in the last four rounds, and it turned out that the 30-year-old Tapia was more comfortable at the frantic pace than was the 23-year-old Romero. The 11th round was the real climax of the battle. If you want to show someone who Johnny Tapia was, turn on the 11th round of his fight against Danny Romero. When the bell sounded at the end of the round, Tapia's true personality was shown. He saw that Romero was dazed and confused and tried to console him, despite the comments that the Romero family had made over the previous years. In the final round, Tapia won by unanimous decision. He had waited for this moment for seven years to show that he belonged in the world of elite boxing. And when his chance came, he took it. Two boxers came together in this confrontation. For one of them, boxing was a profession. For the other, boxing was a way of life. One became a boxer because his father wanted it. The other became a boxer because nature wanted it. Tapia became the world champion and unified the WBO and the IBF titles that evening and became a real success story. How a man with an incredibly difficult past managed to climb to the top. Just listen to the reaction of the audience when the winner is announced. a disciplined fight from start to finish and did you think you needed that to beat Romero? I just did a lot of good things today. I had power, strength, and Aaron. I refused to go down. I refused to lose. And whatever he hit me with, it was not going to hurt me. Beginning of the end. The two championship belts did not stay with him for long. Tapia started putting on weight between fights having an unhealthy passion for cheeseburgers and soda. Another quirk of Tapia was the constant change of coaches, whom he fired throughout his career. Among these were coaches such as Teddy Atlas, Eddie Fuchs, and Freddie Roach. Johnny performed two more title defenses and decided to move to bantamweight. He mastered this category at the end of 1998 when Tapia defeated the WBA champion and outstanding representative of Ghana named Nana Konadu. Even though the judges gave the victory by majority decision, 
This did not reflect the course of the fight in any way. Johnny took almost all the rounds. And the new WBA Bantamweight Champion of the World, Johnny Pumpkin. That is the stupidest judging I have ever seen. Two and a half weeks before his next title defense against Polly Ayala, a call came from the police to Tapia's house. The investigation into the case of his mother's murder was closed by police after they announced that the suspect had died in 1983. 23 years ago, his mother, Virginia Tapia Gallegos, was found here along Albuquerque's West Mesa. She had been stabbed more than 20 times, and to this day, no one has been arrested or charged with her murder. I wanted to find who murdered his mother. Throughout his life, Johnny dreamed of avenging his mother's death personally. In each rival, he saw her killer, and this further fueled Tapia's inner fire. But now, there was no one to take revenge on. The fighter felt overwhelmed and could barely concentrate on training. Johnny's been going through different emotions. Uh, one day he can be very upset, next day he can be crying, next day he'll be very angry. There was a closure in my heart, in my soul, that they finally found out. But kind of pissed off it took so long so many years when they had the right guy right there and then it's showtime the moment had come to meet with Polly Ayala when the ring announcer announced the opponents Tapia came up and pushed Polly when the fight began the challenger shielded himself and began to press Tapia Moving closer, Ayala threw a lot of punches. Tapia acted the same. The fight was crammed with hard exchanges. Ayala had the advantage in speed and was more efficient in most rounds, resulting in Johnny suffering his first career defeat. The ring recognized the meeting as the fight of the year, 1999. Soon, Johnny Tapia got a chance to get a WBO title, owned by Colombian Jorge Alicier Julio. Tapia's motivation and composure caught the viewer's eyes from the very first seconds. He showed great and varied boxing from a long distance. Julio tried to increase the pace as well as the intensity of his actions, which resulted in an action-packed fight. But Mi Vida Loca was more accurate and achieved a landslide victory. As it turned out, the world got to see Johnny fighting at a high level. And the new WBO Bantamweight Champion of the World, Johnny He would soon lose in a rematch to Polly Ayala. The fight was closer than the first one, and after the announcement of the verdict, Tapia and his team were unhappy with the controversial decision. Many viewers and commentators thought that Tapia should have won. In case of a victory, Johnny's side had planned to negotiate a fight with Nassim Hamed. The End Johnny again made changes and fought for the IBF featherweight champion title against Manuel Medina. Medina's goal was to work from the outside at all costs keeping Tapia at arm's length and constantly moving while throwing a series of light punches. Johnny could do little to defend against such tactics, and it seemed as though he would lose the fight. However, Tapia was planning a larger match with the eminent Mexican fighter Marco Antonio Barrera, and a loss against Medina was unacceptable. Johnny received a gift from the judges in the form of a victory by majority decision. Despite Tapia's performance in the ring, he was plagued with personal problems outside of the ring, such as arrests for harboring criminal friends and his involvement with drugs. Soon, Johnny entered the fight with Barrera after vacating the IBF featherweight title and refusing a mandatory title defense. Barrera was considered a 4-1 to one favorite, and the course of the fight confirmed the prediction. During the fight, Barrera was accurate, unhurried, and more precise confidently taking the victory. 
A few months later, Tapia lapsed into a 36-hour drug-induced coma. When he woke up, he immediately asked the doctors for a cheeseburger. The boxer's career finally started going downhill. He was not seen in debt or short of funds, but continued to fight. In 2007, Johnny was once again hospitalized with his fifth drug-induced coma. His wife's brother and nephew decided to visit him. However, they never reached the hospital, having died in a car accident en route to see him. It seemed that death walked next to Tapia all of the time, and he himself firmly believed that tattoos, in the form of angels, were protecting him from death. Tapia adored Mexican music, collected vintage cars, and spoke fluently in a mix of English and Spanish. Outside the ring, he was known as a straightforward and sympathetic person. Fans adored Johnny for his courage and simplicity, and this love was mutual. He often helped the poor and the disadvantaged families of Albuquerque. Tapia left boxing in June 2011 after having conquered three weight classes, and in 2017, he was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. In 2010, our hero was reunited with his father, Jerry Padilla, who was released from federal prison. A DNA test confirmed paternity, but Teresa Tapia denied Padilla's family ties to her husband. Tapia always believed that he would die at the age of 32 like his mother, but lived to 45. He had clinically died five times due to drug overdoses and had repeatedly attempted suicide. 45 years of chaos finally ended though on May 27, 2013 when Johnny Tapia was found dead in his home in Albuquerque. The cause was heart problems with hepatitis C. Death was always so close to him that Johnny Tapia was not afraid of life. Johnny Tapia is an outstanding fighter, one of the biggest little men in boxing over the last decade, and a compelling personalities whose battles with his own demons outside the ring have been as fierce as his battles with opponents inside the ring. Please do not forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to our channel so you won't miss any new episodes about the boxing legends of the past. See you next time.